We are good to go. Uh, I've got lighting over there. I've got my microphone on. Everything is good. Uh, and we will do the obligatory little bit of a wait for all of those that have adverts. But I don't think we'll have many people waiting because I have started early uh, just to catch those out. And we've got standard in here. Hello, standard. And we've got my get subs so far. Very good. And uh, an interesting thing. This is the 40th code zone. 40th code zone. Can you imagine 40th? And, uh, well, tonight I thought um, I was going to do continuation of production chains, uh, but I'm going to leave that for a second because I'm actually becoming very conscious I've not put any code out to the masses for some time. Uh, and I felt, uh, actually, one of the things I, I, I want to put out there is something I've been rather foolishly calling Game Kit, which we'll have to change the name of. Uh, and the so tonight we're going to look at some of the uh, the Pixel Game Engine extensions that uh, I, I think I want to sort of get a move on with. And there's there's sort of three in particular. Uh, and tonight we'll look at this one, which is this Game Kit thing. Uh, and I'm going to get some sort of uh, community participation going on as well. I think in this stream. Uh, first time chat uh, from ooh the futurist. Uh, hello. Uh, Chocolate and Milk, hello. Sleeping Insomniac, hello. Gruffler, hello. Good to see all. Good to see some familiar faces in the chat as usual. So we're sort of celebrating 40, ep 40 episodes of uh, Code Zone so far. I mean, that's, uh, that's insane because given that they're all an hour each, uh, that's that's 40 whole hours. And you see how I did the maths really quickly there. That's, that's an important skill to have as a, an aspiring programmer. And, oh, Gruffler, oh, hang on, I must turn that down, or else I'm going to wake a certain X10 up. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Gruffler, much appreciated. Uh, dibs on the Engon drawing routines. Ah, so, yes, so there's there's sort of two sort of threads to this, and we're, we're going to talk about all of these different things tonight. So, um, to talk about the, the code, talk about the sort of Pixel Game Engine stuff, uh, and we'll see where it goes. But I do actually want some some feedback from the audience. Uh, and tonight I have just plain old tea. Uh, nothing particularly fancy going on. Uh, so Christian Siler, hello. Uh, and right, let, let's let's just get going. I think I'm presumably the adverts have stopped for everybody. Uh, so I have rather foolishly created a pixel game engine extension called GameKit. In total blissful ignorance that actually that name is well somewhat reserved by a rather large fruit company dominant in the sectors of which I participate. Uh, so uh, I need a new name for it. Apostolisk, hello, I've not seen you for a few a few episodes. Good to see you back. Uh, so yes, I need a new name for it. And uh, what I want is uh, something that sort of encapsulates, well, uh, stuff that you would use, nuts and bolts, the scaffolding of a game engine because I get a lot of this. I get a lot of Javid, the Pixel Game Engine isn't really a game engine. So I've decided instead uh, I'm going to shut those people up by actually releasing a suite of tools which allows you to quickly put together some games. Yeah, good to see you, Apostle. It's good to see the things going. Fruit Kit, <laughs> which is <your> Apple Kit. <laughs> uh, I one of the things is it's going to be part of a namespace, so I would I'd like it to actually only be sort of three letters long. So uh, we'll have you know keep it keep it going in the chat. Uh, what can you come up with that is three letters long that could be a suitable name for this engine? And I don't I just generally don't know. Um, or less than three letters potentially because it works like this. And I'll show you some examples because uh, you may have noticed on Twitter if you follow me on Twitter, I, I posted a tweet yesterday of, of, uh, of, of uh, one of the tools as part of this uh, this game kit. It won't be called game kit forever, uh, and I also put it on the Discord server as well. But I thought we'd have a look. And the idea is it's it contains utilities which just the stuff that you use all the time and to stop you having to recode it. Now, this is by no means an original idea, certainly not even with Pixel Game Engine. There are members of the community that have also excuse me, also done the same sort of thing. But whereas I thoroughly and wholeheartedly encourage people to go developing their own extensions and contributing their own code, uh, it one of the things that is important is there's a thread of core utilities which I am responsible for maintaining, either with other people's help, uh, but it's 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 sort of it's a known sort of baseline, a known standard within the OLC ecosystem. 
EG. EG is a possible. GK. <laughs> I think I might be a bit too close to the original. Although I've rather frustratingly named all of my files GK, GK, GK. Uh, so, for example, we'll go. We'll have a look at some of the code behind these things because I have. Uh, and sorry, Saladin, if you end up watching this, I have rewritten the animated sprite class. Uh, so I have a, so a way of handling animations, and in particular, I have a generic versatile camera. Uh, where is my camera? Where is it? Where is it? There it is. Uh, so an OLC game kit camera. Now I've left all of the namespace prefixes on just because it helps me sort of understand what I'm doing and I'm being verbose about these things. Obviously, I think you would come up with cleverer ways to disguise all of that. Uh, MGK roaming kilt. MGK. You have to tell me what these things stand for, and I have to make sure they're not rude. Easy K. <laughs> <laughs> FTW, that's an interesting one. <laughs> I do like that one. <laughs> FTW. Hmm. Oh, I'll, to, uh, I'll tell you what, I will, I will go into the uh, Code Zone chat on the Discord. I I'm just going to bang some of these down. So, uh, FTW, uh, apostolisk. I'm doing it very uh, tight. MGK from uh, My Game Kill, <laughs> Roaming Kilt. I'll get all my typos going on here. Uh, Easy K from Regetsub. And uh, yes, hi Speedy. Yes, didn't see you there. For the weird, for the weird, or just for the win, right? For the win game kit. Uh, but. Oh, I will, I'll play the demo and we can, we can have a look. So if you didn't actually see this yesterday, uh, this is a very simple demonstration. Uh, to sort of demo... I wanted to demonstrate actually what, what is this all about. So here is a game scene created using game kit. Uh, and I have a, an animated man, or really, well, could be a man, I suppose it's a man. Um, an animated man walking around a, a rather large desert. And the desert has boundaries, and when you approach those boundaries, the camera sort of locks onto them and uh, your, your guy walks off. This is typical stuff that's been around since the NES, if not before. Right? There's nothing particularly clever about doing it this way. And what the demonstration application allows you to do is you can press the tab key and that enters you into sort of like a free roaming mode. So I can use the middle mouse button to pan and zoom everywhere. And we can actually see how the character moves relative to the viewing window of the camera. So the, the simple camera, and I, I think there will be quite a number of different camera modes, uh, but I have four to get us going. Uh, the first one is this simple camera. It simply locks directly to a target that is tracked, and I'll show you how it does that later because there's some interesting points to that. Uh, so it, it just locks to this uh, location. But as we get within the, uh, the boundaries of the world, so there's the entire world, the actual viewing area is clamped to within those boundaries. Your little man can still go out there, there's no collision detection or anything like that. Um, but the, the camera itself is physically locked, so if I press the tab key again, I can actually go back into the mode that the camera is being viewed in. So let's zoom out uh, and let's have a look at edge move. So this is mode number two. So edge move, you can see the camera doesn't move until the uh, player or the object being tracked gets close enough to the boundaries to sort of push it around a bit. And again, it remains clamped to the world. Uh, so when we're actually playing the game, it looks a bit like this. Now, I'm in two thoughts about this particular mode because, one, it, it's quite nice and it's certainly useful if you've got like battles and things going on and you don't want the screen constantly moving. Um, but actually for exploration, you never really know what's coming up. So there's, there's pros and cons to that sort of mood. Uh, the next one is a uh, lazy follow. So if I go to press three there, so lazy follow is pretty much the same as simple, uh, but it's smoothed, and it's smoothed with a biasing factor. And this is actually the mode that we use in space thing to sort of pan the camera from one location to the other. So if I zoom out on here, uh, we can see where the viewing window is, and we can see that it it sort of gently, uh, gently sort of scrolls towards where the player is. And as usual, it's also physically clamped to the game world. Now, I want the physical clamping for one reason. Firstly, it looks great when you're doing stuff like this. It's clearly a world edge. Uh, but it also allows you to do things like in, in the uh, early stages of the, say, the, the Nintendo Entertainment System where you could only really scroll in one direction. Uh, it, and you actually see it now in things like Metroidvanias, and I've recently been playing it in Reventure. 
You want certain areas of your world to have sort of a fixed camera uh, sort of linearity. So as I'm walking along the world, I can't move it up and down. And so the world boundary isn't actually anything to do with where the tiles are. It's a rectangle defined within the world. At the moment, it just happens to be uh, the same as the, the where the tiles are. Now, the final mode is also quite an interesting one. It's screens. Uh, now, screens is cool, I think. This is really old school. So here we've got our man walking around. And when he goes off the edge of one screen, he appears onto the next. And it's properly old school stuff. And if we, if we zoom out and have a look at the free roaming view, uh, we can see all that's really happening is that the world is being broken up into discrete screens. And as the, as the object being tracked passes from one zone to the next, uh, the camera view, which would be the top left, is simply, well, it's, uh, it's just clamped there. It's a very simple, uh, trivial operation to actually work that one out. Now, all of these four modes follow exactly the same principle behind the scenes for the camera. So it's very easy to add different camera modes and get different behaviors using exactly the same infrastructure uh, that's set up. So I can ha quite happily change between one camera and the other, and it doesn't all fall apart. Uh, let's catch up with the chat. Oh, no, I'm in the chats. Uh, OK, OLC kit. <laughs> <laughs> my game kit. Yeah, I'm going to try and avoid uh, my game kit. Ooh, the WTF. I, I like that one as well. Let's, let's bang that one in there. <laughs> so, uh, that's an example of a utility that's provided by whatever we call this thing uh, to make life easy for the player and I'll show you how it's like, well for the programmer so I'll show you how it's used in, in this case it, it's combined with a transformed view which we've seen a few times uh, but it doesn't have to be and that's sort of one of the underlying design principles that I'm, I'm going to make for this extension um, that it doesn't rely on being used with multiple other components of the extension in order to work uh, so you define a camera by creating the camera object uh, and I give it the size of the viewing area. Now it's the size of the screen in pixels but because we've got a tile transformed view uh, everything is happening in tile space. And my tiles are 16 by 16 pixels in this case. So I actually tell the camera well your view uh, is, is in tile space too. The pixel game kit PGK PGK uh, by Sleeping Insomniac. <coughs> so yes, we create the uh, the camera view in tile space, and then I tell it to do something. So in this case, I tell it to set the target, uh, which is the point in this case. The point is the the player object in this world. Now it doesn't have to be. It can quite easily also be a constant. It can be some other object that's following around. The target is uh, there's a few overloads for that. Uh, the idea being is that the camera itself is going to sort of maintain its position in the world. The the programmer doesn't have to do so. Uh, and I set what type of camera it's going to be. So I start off with the simple type, and I set the world boundary, which is just that defining rectangle with which the world is is clamped to. Uh, now don't forget this is also in tile space and my entire world in this instance is 80 by 75 tiles and you think well why is it 80 by 75 and when you start thinking in terms of pixels rather than 3d graphics all of these things start to make sense uh, the game engine itself is 256 by 240 which is the default pixel game engine starting up uh, and i wanted my boundary to be five full screens because when i demonstrate screen camera mode i want it to it's quite obvious it's clamping from one screen to the next all the way up you don't have half a bit of world sticking out on one of the screens uh, so it just scales up so 80 by uh, 5 by 5 times by 16 it all works out it's fine uh, then I'm using renderables, which I guess are they're now core on the Pixel Game Engine, but they could have been an early type of thing that's in the game kit. Uh, and I then go and populate the world with some random junk to make it so it's not just one all, all one colour. We'll come back to the animation stuff in a minute. Uh, then to handle the, the camera, uh, it's very simple. I just have 
Where is it? There we are. Uh, camera update. Now that will handle everything else for us. We don't need to do anything at all. All of this additional code is just handling changing the camera type in real time and switching between free roaming and camera managed mode. So that, that requires a little bit of thought because it's kind of undoing the stuff uh, that the camera is set up to do. Uh, maybe that's something we actually want for the camera to handle. I don't know. We'll think about that. Uh, and then from the tile transform view, you can get, as you've always been able to from the transform view, you can get the top left tile, you get the bottom right tile, you only need to draw what you can see, uh, which is great. And this is using the new draw partial decal routine, which is only included in 2.17, which I've still not released, uh, which is now uh, artifact free whenever you're drawing things. And so that's it. So all the, all the programmer has to do is worry about that line, set up what they want the camera to do and how they want it to behave, and it just does its own thing. <laughs> OMG. EGG <laughs> uh, egg by Gruffler. Uh, what else we got? Uh, oh, Morris is here. Hi, Morris. Oh, and Dandestine is here. Hello, Dandestine. Uh, Null Biter. Hello. <laughs> did, did I get botted? Did I? <laughs> well, I don't think they'll uh, have much uh, of, of an impact. I doubt on on uh, on on our chat. Certainly, I think everybody's a bit too clever for the bots. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, right, so that's one of the tools, camera, right? Really simple, easy to use, uh, and quite versatile. And I thought we could have a think about what other types of camera modes are there. That's something useful to have in our, in our game kit. Uh, I've also added, and somewhat, uh, hopefully in a nice way, not totally replaced Saladin's animated sprite, extension, uh, but I have come up with something which I think is simpler, easier, and a little bit more versatile. Uh, and it works like this. So again, we have a special sort of sub namespace in the, uh, the, the PEGX called Animate, and this is going to handle all the things related to animation. <laughs> yeah, Morris, we've not had a chat in, in the, uh, the voice chat for a while. Why buy followers and viewers? Let the algorithm do its thing. I completely agree. Yeah, you know, just just keep slogging away at it, and eventually people people notice you there. And there's there's all sorts of weirdos out there in the world. <laughs> now. I have, uh, for my animation, uh, sort of two important states for animation. So the man, as he was walking around, we'll go back to uh, you can see that he is animated uh, in sort of the four compass directions. Uh, and in fact, I will pull up the mega sprite. Let me just find where that is. Right, there we go. Uh, so I have something called the mega sprite. Uh, which is basically all of these characters mapped out in one big sprite. Yeah, you probably recognize them. They're from a popular, uh, sort of often made available uh, asset pack. Uh, I think it's called Fantasy Time or something like that. And there's all sorts of tiles and characters and things. So that's where he's come from. And they've got uh, various animations of him walking about, laughing, shaking his head, and doing whatever it is that he needs to be doing. <laughs> Welcome, easy extensions box. Ah, oh, we can't have that, Dandestine, because uh, it's got to be three letters, and it's certainly not being the other similar three letter word. <laughs> um, right, so uh, you may have noticed, yes, he's animated, that's great, uh, but one of the differences between the actual out the pegex uh, animation extension is you need to sort of keep duplicating the graphics in order to have things work and and I, I don't necessarily like that approach um, although the, the animation works very well I think it can be quite wasteful of resources uh, so I have 
two different things. Uh, firstly, I have something called an animation object. Now, we'll have a look at how that's constructed in a minute. Uh, and then I have an animation state object, which is entirely separate. Fundamentally, the animation object uh, will store the actual source information of the frames, whether the whole frames or bits of frame or something like that out of a larger sprite. Uh, and it also stores the, uh, the, the states that those animations can potentially be in. Uh, animation state is the lightweight object that you'll have many, many copies of. So the whole animation information is actually stored in one big lump once, and it can be reused all over your application uh, without unnecessary duplication. I quite, I quite like that approach. Uh, what are we naming? We missed something. Uh, yeah, we've got to name it rather stupidly. I called it Game Kit, and uh, <laughs> I can't. I can't call it that. <laughs> so, so we're looking for a different name. Uh, and it's it's specifically for this uh, this extension, which is handling sort of these this utility suite of uh, bits and pieces to help you put games together. Uh, so we've got Dur from Gruffler. Mm. Don't know. I don't know about Dur. Delicious extension pack. Don't know about that one. Uh, we've got uh, supplemental game routines. SGR from Morris. Uh, so we'll have a look at how this animation is set up. Now, animations, of course, need graphics. So I've got my terrain here, and I've got my walking graphic. Uh, and I'm going to set up uh, an animation object. Now, that happens to be sort of one of the last things that we, we want to do. Uh, I've got the animation here called Anim Desk, Anim Animation Description. Uh, and the animation description contains a, a, well, a map of sequences. And sequences contain frames. And this is where it differs a little bit from how we've done the sprites before. So I have a frame sequence here, which is a sequence of uh, image locations that represent that animation. Uh, so in, in this instance, the frame sequence is uh, walking south. Now, by default, the frame sequence object uh, has some parameters too. Now, we can specify what's the duration of the frame. Uh, in, as in, is it, in this case, it's 10 frames per second, so the duration is 0.1 of a second between frames. Uh, and we also have a, a, a sort of playback mode. So how should the animation play out? And that's things like, should it play forwards, backwards, be one shot? Or as in Saladin's thing, should it ping pong backwards and forwards uh, between the two? So you can specify those sort of parameters as part of how that sequence is constructed. Then we want to add the individual frames to this animation uh, frame sequence. UTL. <laughs> utils, pretty, it's four letters. It's not very, it's not very sexy though. Util, is it? Kit Carson, hello. <laughs> uh, CPU complementary pixel utils. Well, I'll add that to the little. Oh, keep banging my microphone there. Uh, that's from uh, Standard End. UTL, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know, yeah, yeah. That is not, it's not grabbing me that one. Sorry, Morris. Uh, so, yes, we're going to add frames independently to this uh, frame sequence. Now, here's one of the main and first differences. Uh, I'm passing in a, uh, a reference to the, well, the address of a decal, or a, in this case, it's a renderable. So, you might want to use animations in the sprite world, you might want to use it in the decal world, you have that kind of choice. You've got to pass in a renderable. Uh, and then you pass in the rectangle of where that frame's graphic exists. So it could be the whole frame, uh, which is the default. So if you're loading up your individual frames as individual images, uh, then that's all you need to do. But if you're using sort of snipping out a small rectangle of uh, a larger sheet, then uh, that's how you would approach this. So in my with my mega sprite, uh, I'm chopping out, uh, in particular walking south, which is this first, I'm chopping out that image, then that image, then that image. So the three frames make up the walking south. And the nice part about this is, this is very lightweight information, um, and 
I can I can change this sort of on the fly if I wanted to do sort of some weird animation things. Uh, but I, it's also it's nice because it, it is sort of discreet. It doesn't matter where your information is coming from. Is it from single images? Is it from a whole a tile map? It doesn't really matter, and the system doesn't care either uh, because it's always going to use draw partial sprite, and if the draw partial sprite is using the whole sprite surface as its uh, rectangle, then so be it. That's fine. So we create these frame sequences for the four walking directions. I also have one uh, which doesn't actually have any uh, multiple frames, it just has a single frame, which is when we're idle, we're just stood there doing nothing. PPU, playable pixel utils. PPU, that might cause confusion. Apostolisk, TKT, OLC, TKT, <laughs> TKT. Uh, TKT sounds a li little bit like TCL or tickle, doesn't it? Uh, don't know, don't know about that one. I've got nightmares about that language. Um, now, once we've defined the frame sequences, uh, we then need to sort of name them. So this, this is then added into a state machine. And the state machine, uh, you simply add the name and you add in the frame sequence that we've created. This has all been added into the animation uh, description structure. And this is all static information for the most part. It never changes. And if we had 20 guys all with the same set of animations, they're all going to pick from this animation pool. But what makes this a little bit different from the animated sprite pegex is there is no actual state information stored within the description. Uh, the description is merely a library with which I can go in with a token and say, right, I want this particular state at any given time. And so we'll have a look at how that works in a moment. But to handle the actual animation, uh, I'm just checking the velocity uh, components of my character walking around, and I set the state of that animation. And before I draw him, uh, I, I have an update equivalent here. I might actually rename this update for some sort of, like, I don't know, extension consistency that's in there. Um, I update the state of my animation just simply by passing, well, accumulating F elapsed time. And at any point, uh, I can grab the frame uh, using the animation state from my animation description, and it goes away and chews all, all the maths and says, well, you want this particular frame. Uh, so that, that can be different for all the different sprites. It's reusing the graphics. It's it's nice. It's good. I like that. Uh, let's have a look. I was trying to make something fit logically into ALU, but nothing's really coming to me. Uh, auxiliary. Uh, uh, yeah, too hard. Something util. I don't know. Uh, additional light utils, LGK, the Lone Gain Kit. We'll add that one on there. LGK from Guy McBrofist. When somebody actually reads out these names on a stream, do any of you ever go, oh, I shouldn't have chose that? Uh, right, PTK from Roman Kill. That one's, that one's professional, isn't it? PTK. From uh, roaming kilt. Uh, Gruffler OLC CLO. <laughs> Complementary lean options. Apex. Apex is uh, Apex is interesting. It's a bit. Uh, <laughs> I'm going. Uh, shouldn't choose that right now. <laughs> Uh, Apex by Null Python. Now that one's technically four letters, so I don't know. Uh, null, uh, null Biter, sorry, yeah. Null Biter. <laughs> Apex is only three, though. Uh, duck butt with vector thrust. Hello. <laughs> and Josh Rosario, hello. <laughs> Mycon, what are we naming it? So, uh, yes, uh, I've, I've created a, or I'm in the process of basically gluing together all of my utilities into one sort of monster pegex, uh, which will allow us to then sort of, well, allow anybody to sort of quickly use the parts to create games. And Dragon Eyes here as well, good. 
Uh, so that's how the uh, the animation works. As you can see, it's very simple from the user's perspective. They just need to establish this database. Now, if you're externalizing this information, that's completely acceptable too. So if you're pulling it in from some sort of config file or, or something, uh, description file, uh, that's that's all fine. It doesn't care. It's happy happy with that. Uh, and so all the user needs to do is update the, uh, the state time with f elapsed time. I'll probably encapsulate that in a method just to make it consistent. Uh, and at any point, they just grab the frame that they want to work with. So in this case, I'm grabbing the, the reference to the frame and just drawing it, in this case, as a decal. It, all it does is pull the renderable back, because the renderables don't change. They're not videos, uh, but you're choosing a specific renderable and a specific location at any one time. And you always use draw partial decal to draw it. That may change, and that might change simply because I, I think I might move to something like a draw animated uh, something, uh, just to keep it a bit separate, because it's always going to need this additional information. Uh, so I think there's a tidier way uh, to, to sort of handle this transaction. But, as mentioned before, one of my underlying principles is I don't want to sort of funnel the user into a specific way of doing things. I'm just going to provide a load of utility functions uh, which hopefully they can, they're sort of self-explanatory and they naturally glue together but don't have to. Cug. Cug from Morris. Hmm. Ape. Roman Kilt's definitely having a, a full stab at this. Ape. Uh, roaming Kilt. Uh, Coog. CRK and DEZ. Designated Extension Zone. DEZ. Uh, Dandestine. Uh, CRK, CRK from Speedy. I quite like that one, CRK. What we end mamming. Now let's have a look inside some of this code uh, because uh, th there's other things that I, I do want to include, but there's, there's like other cool bits and pieces I wanted to show. So uh, I'm, I, I developed this uh, sort of this pegx using multiple files, but of course the pegx is a single file solution, and so I made myself a little utility for sort of gluing together um, source files. Now there's nothing particularly clever about it. Uh, oh, by the way, yes, I should paste this if you actually want to play with the uh, the camera thing. Uh, you can click on it there and, and have a play with it. You, you need a you need a mouse with a, a middle button. A, a trackpad won't do it. That's something I'm learning that actually I, I need to start navigating camera control. I'm I'm so used to using my middle mouse button for scrolling and panning and things, uh, but uh, you know, laptops suck. Uh, that's all I can say really about that. Uh, no, Dragon Eye, you've uh, you've not got the uh, the memo the. Uh, so, yes, as you can see, I have all of these different uh, files. So let's have a look at animation. Uh, animation state. So this is the, the lightweight bit of information, which all it contains is the name of the state, how long you've been in it, uh, and a little utility function which basically sets that name and resets the time uh, if the name is different. Because it's quite convenient that if you're in a walking state, every single frame you want to set, I am walking to the left, every single frame. Uh, but you, 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 want, you don't want to sort of reset the state time. So there's some, there's some cleverness to this. I say cleverness, it's not really. Uh, so we don't actually uh, reset the state time if we're not actually changing state, even though we're calling this function. Uh, so uh, in my code here, I have some rather obvious token, um, which is basically allows me to sort of name a region of the code uh, in such a way that I can extract it easily later. Uh, and that's all my tool does. And I go away and create a template file which looks like this. So it has all the, the naming and things, and it has the disclaimers at the top, and the license. Uh, and I can then go and construct the basic outline of uh, Pixel Game Engine extension. And I can go into the files and I can pull out the sections that I'm interested in. So I name the file and pull out the section. And I can have multiple sections within files. Uh, and I sort of, in a way, I construct the, uh, the file manually here. This allows me to just sort of work more fluidly as things get longer. I'm actually, this is what I want to do with the Pixel Game Engine 2, just to make it easier to maintain. Uh, root. 
Grut from Gruffler. Uh, TBA. <laughs> Maybe we should have CBA as well, <laughs> since it's a it's a way of being lazy about doing things. Uh, for my con, I, I'm going to add CBA. Every day X nine. Uh, so yes, I have a little utility which then, when I go and build the uh, the game kit project, uh, it's it's called. I'll show you. If you didn't know how to to do these things, maybe not everyone's familiar with uh, Visual Studio in this regard. Uh, hopefully, these are not too small; that you can't see anything. Um, so in Visual Studio, you have the ability to actually run scripts at various stages of the build, and this can be quite useful for organizing your sort of output. Uh, so. I, uh, in working environments, I tend to use scripts to build up a deployment folder. As you know how in Visual Studio, you've got your files all in your project folder, all mixed up with your code, and you've got assets all over the place. What's the bit that you actually want to, to sort of deploy on your customer's machine? Uh, so I actually usually run a, either a batch script, or you can run the individual commands here to start uh, copying things around um, uh, and placing the So anything you can run in a command prompt, uh, you can type in here. Uh, and and run it as a script. Uh, in this case, though, I'm not running it as a script. I have actually made a little uh, e executable utility, which takes in a template file, which we've just seen, and you sort of give it the uh, the output. In this case, uh, the output is going to be in my deployment folder, the game kit .header file. So it's it's just a simple tool, uh, but this is very useful uh, if you've, if you've not used it. And as always, when you're playing with properties in Visual Studio, be it where. Uh, for the most part, you probably want to be in all configurations and all platforms. So many people I've seen on the Discord and on YouTube have problems because they'll change some settings for debug, but then carry on running all of the code in release and wonder why nothing's actually changed. I bet you that's happened to you if you've used Visual Studio at some point. I bet you it has. Software and game dev is a thing now. Yeah, it's alright. It keeps, keeps the numbers down. Exactly. What about when we want to see some hurdy gurdy? Well, the hurdy gurdy is still sat on the bench. It's got my headphones on it at the moment. <laughs> Smash highlights CBA is good. <laughs> so this goes away and constructs a file. We'll have a look at this file. This file looks like this. This is the final output file, as you might imagine. Um, it's just the uh, the template file, but exploded with basically automated cut and paste bits of the other files. There's some intelligence, so it does actually detect things like includes and it pulls them all, so you don't have to uh, sort of manually start uh, re reconstructing the includes. There, there's some intelligence to how this uh, this file works. But anyway, we'll go back to the uh, animation state object now. Uh, so this is the lightweight thing that you're passing around. Uh, I did want to ask the question, and it's good to see that there's some uh, some people that might actually know the answer here. So Morris might know, Dandestein, Magetsub, uh, Standard Int, yeah, uh, you know, proper uh, C++ users. Uh, is there is there a compile time compile time sort of hash map in the C++ language? And if not, why not? Uh, so there's a question. Uh, speedy has come up with get there, something like that. Get speedy C. Best you can do is standard array, standard pair. Uh, but look, what I what I kind of want is a system whereby. I don't want to have to define an enum class, but I want to have sort of a lightweight token system for naming states. But it, you know, it's something the compiler can completely all sort of organize at compile time. Compiler mostly generates best comparisons for finding stuff. I, I think it's, uh, maybe I've not sort of articulated what it is I'm after well enough. And you know, we'll come back to why I've had this this train of thought later on. Uh, but let's have a look at the animation object. So this is the animation sort of description itself. 
And we're going to have a look at some code for this animation description. Uh, there's nothing to it, as you can see. It's simply we add the frames uh, as a sequence and we get a particular frame at a particular time uh, based on the state. So when you're passing the state, it goes, well, which sequence am I after? Uh, it uses the name to extract that. And then it goes to get frame and calls the state time. So really, all of the interesting stuff uh, is happening in this uh, frame sequence object, which is a little bit more complicated. Uh, Everything revolves around this get frame. So you pass in the time that you want. Uh, there's no state information anymore because this is just a frame sequence. It assumes time starts at zero uh, and it knows the duration uh, of all the frames in this sequence. And, and this, this is really it. So the, when you call get frame, uh, you pass in a particular time that has to be converted to a specific index uh, within the vector of frames that this stores. Uh, and that index is computed in different ways depending on how the, the mode you're in. I've not actually implemented uh, Saladin's ping pong mode, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. And so it's very, very simple. And, and that's, what I, that's what surprised me once I actually built this animation system is there's well, it's, the whole thing is potentially like 60 lines of code, uh, but it's actually proven to be very versatile. Uh, there's really not much to it at all. So other things that I wanted to include in this extension, I, and this is why I was talking about the compile time stuff. Uh, in space thing, and we, you know, we actually spent some time developing this asset pool. Uh, and it was I was very proud of it because it was a reasonably complicated set of uh, templates and it used the uh, uh, curiously recurring template pattern uh, and <laughs> all sorts of like crazy modern stuff. And I was thinking recently, well, actually, why does anybody need these sort of constructions? What what does it what does it buy us that a compile time hash map wouldn't be able to deliver? Yeah, I think yeah, Dandestein sort of verbalized it better than I have. You want a convenient way for the program to name states without the baggage of using standard string to actually identify uh, states. Yeah, exactly. Right? There's 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 no there's no sort of reason why that can't be the case. Uh, the, 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 there should be a fairly static data structure object that I can set up. And yes, it would be basically an array, but the compiler is smart enough at compile time to translate that string into just an index into that array. Because that would be very useful, because then you can load up all of your assets and you can name them with something which is sensible, but then there is no overhead of, uh, of calling the, uh, of you actually using the strings. I just think uh, there shouldn't be, well, I mean, I, the, st the string view doesn't actually get rid of the string in this instance. And so it occurred to me when I was thinking about how to do this uh, with, with assets, every single time I've created a larger project, I've always created some sort of asset manager. And I was trying to justify why, and maybe you guys have got some ideas why I need to do this. Um, so this one in principle works by using the file name as, as a string, like we've just been discussing. <laughs> It associates that string with a graphic. But there's no point in your program where you need that sort of flexibility. Your program always needs to know what it's going to draw. So those names, they're all static anyway, and that's why I'm interested in, in sort of this, uh, this string alternative. If you do have sort of dynamic assets being loaded, you're just going to load them into a vector or a structure, but you're still going to track the index somehow. So you're going to provide your own mechanism for doing that. So I, I, I wonder if, because uh, you see quite a few people think, oh, I need this asset manager. It's a really important part of my project. It's, it's, is it really? The only benefit I can see is that it's somehow it's a single object that you can pass around your project, which effectively becomes a big global object. Um, but yeah, I'm less convinced that it's as necessary as uh, I used to think of it. Uh, you can do something, but not entirely a compiler. You see, that's it, interests. I think, why why not? Right? There should be some way of, of doing that just at compile time. I'm sure the template uh, greybeards in the C++ chat on the Discord will be able to, uh, um, to, to work something out. <laughs> 
They probably, by the time this stream's finished, there'll be some code already posted there. Uh, <laughs> and people will be chewing into it. It's an interesting problem. Uh, and I might have a go at it myself as well. Uh, so, yes, other things that I'm going to be including in this uh, kit, uh, and you've probably seen some of the names already, uh, is a rudimentary collision. Now, this is, I will stress, not a physics engine by any means. It's purely going to wrap up the uh, the circle versus circle collisions, circle versus tile collisions, and uh, rectangles versus tiles, and rectangles versus rectangles, and circles versus circles, and all of the stuff that I've done in videos. Uh, we'll just sort of wrap those up into a standard user interface. Um, and I, I, that, that's, uh, that's just handy, because I think I'm also going to add to this system a, a sort of shorthand for describing layers. Fundamentally, in 2D, you, you always tend to generate your games the same way. You have several layers of tile map. Uh, what that is, is unknown. I prefer my tiles to be uh, single type uh, 2D arrays. Other people prefer the tiles to be uh, actual objects. Uh, some people also prefer, prefer their tiles to be you know, just a single index into an array of predefined tile objects. Uh, there's lots of different ways of doing it. Uh, so I, I think I might provide some mechanisms to actually just handle tiles directly. And hopefully then maybe the community can make it plug into tiled or something similar. <laughs> if you can try to force the command to only take in string literals. Yeah, standard int. I think it's it's an interesting problem and I, I just wonder why it's it probably is solved. <laughs> Good. Well at least people are chatting about it anyway. So this is where I'm up to. I've not actually gone ahead and implemented sort of the the background of this yet either. Uh, so I've started throwing in some of the uh, the basic checks and things, but there's not much to it. It's just it's just got some simple routines to handle uh, because as you're walking around your maps or your tile maps, then you might have things like a platform game. You want to not walk through the platforms. You might have events that get triggered, and so that's potentially another system that's going to get added in here is a, a lightweight sort of event system. Uh, to tell you when a particular thing has occurred and you can register your interest in those events and handle them uh, appropriately and these are let's say they're all just utilities i don't want to funnel the user into a particular way of doing things they're just there to be assistive and they have some sort of commonality amongst them and then people can stop going well jared it's not really a game engine it's just a rendering framework you know, they, they can shut up and go away uh, right, the other PEGX uh, that uh, we, I wanted to sort of draft some ideas with you about uh, is sound, uh, PEGX sound. Uh, so, oh, Channel Mouse, hello. Um, those of you that have ever used the sound PEGX uh, probably know it's got some limitations, but actually fundamentally it works. And it works very well because it had a lot of contributions from Magetsub in the chat, uh, and it had a lot of contributions from Slavka off the Discord server. Uh, and Gorbit as well has also had a uh, had his hand stuck in it, and it's actually quite a, a quite a good tool. It works across platforms. It does broadly what we need to do with sound. The problem is it comes up against libraries such as SoLoud, which is just really good. It's it's really nice to use. It's easy to set up. It's easy to get running, uh, and it 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 just works. That said. Uh, I, I chat with people about these things, and Dan Dastine is, I think, a prominent advocate of this. In order to be considered sensible for a gaming environment, you need a sound utility of some description. And there seems to be this sort of uh, feeling that the sound PEGX in its current form uh, is insufficient. I can perhaps understand that. It Its origins were from the console game engine. In fact, it's almost identical uh, to the console game engine one. And uh, for, well, probably about... 12 months, 18 months, something like that, it didn't work very well. So people would compile it and there would be an error that pops up and I would lazily sort of say, well, actually you're using the wrong version of the file, which is true, you should be using the one from the NES emulator series, and then they go and compile a NES emulator series and then they say, well, that's not working with the Pixel Gaming. And so there's also, that hasn't helped <laughs> with matters. My laziness has been a problem there. Uh, but I think uh, it's time to sort of breathe some life back into sound and, and make it uh, so people can use it again. And it, 
it's a uh, it it does it's not compatible with Inscripton at the moment either. Now that's a big thing for me. I, I think the the Inscripton uh, roadmap for the the Pixel Game Engine is a very important one. And Dandestein and Morris, who are the really sort of the, the and and Magetsub, sorry, the like the the leaders of that sort of package of work, um, have done an excellent job with it. Uh, first time chat, Jaljalis. Hello, finally see me live. Great, thank you for all the stuff you made. Oh well, thank you very much. No, I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Um, as you can see, it's it's far more chaotic and disorganised than uh, <laughs> than the videos. And more, more, we do more talking about code than actual code. Uh, and Magetsum quite rightly says, "Buddy, your sound never gets enough love from programmers." So I think you're right. And I want to approach sound a bit differently uh, to how it's done currently. Uh, there isn't anything in this project at the moment. It's it's empty. I've got nothing to show. The Sound Pegex in its current construction, uh, it's, it's really aimed at the sort of console game engine generation, as it were. It has an initialize function, and it has a load sound, and it has a play sound function, and that is all it provides. Uh, which is fine, but it's got some little quirks to itself, which are which are annoying. So. Uh, it also allowed you to create some uh, callback functions. So you could, for example, uh, if you were generating your sound, synthesizer style, style stuff, uh, it would prompt you periodically to fill a buffer with a waveform. How you generated that waveform was up to you, and we had a lot of fun with that in the Code It Yourself synthesizer series. Uh, but the, the the idea was that this, this waveform could get played, and if you've actually played with the sound pegx, you may have noticed after about... 45 seconds-ish, something strange happens. The pitch changes of everything. <laughs> so that's a, that's quite an interesting bug in its own right, and it's that's down to the precision of the timing uh, being kept by the framework. Uh, so there's things like that that I, I would want to uh, to sort of address, because right? that makes it unusual, particularly for, don't forget, the remit of everything that I'm doing, all of the one-loan coder stuff, pixel gaming, is, it's aimed for getting people up and running quickly and having some fun and learning. Uh, it doesn't have to be the most performant code ever. I'm wondering why so many games just play sound through walls like they're not even there. <laughs> ah, we see my con. That's uh, how Magetsub and I sort of started talking to each other about actually how do you model some sound bouncing around the room quite easily. Uh, sound is actually really hard still because it makes it very sensitive to processing time. Yeah, that was the argument I made in the, the NES emulator series that it's it's really forgiving. Uh, so it's really unforgiving. You've got, you know, in, in terms of processing for sound, uh, you've got uh, like months in comparison to doing graphics it's it's slow right you only need to generate a sample at that most at 96 kilohertz which is nothing on a on a computer uh, but the problem is as soon as it one thing starts to go wrong uh, you as a human are very very astute at picking this up you, you you're very sensitive to sort of the uh, the inadequacy of the system playing the sounds that's why it's it's unforgiving. Uh, it 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 is relentless march. You have absolutely no um, exceptions available to you. You've got to always provide the sample as and when you need to. Graphics, nobody cares, right? If you miss a frame, people just go, "Oh, the frame rate's slow." It doesn't actually stop the immersion, but as soon as that sound starts popping and squeaking and and dropping out, uh, people start to complain. So yeah, sound is actually a it's 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 difficult. I think a lot of people get a bit carried away that, oh, we need now 7.1 3D sound and all that kind of stuff. That's exciting, but, you know, it, for the most part, it's not what anybody really requires. I, I don't have such a system and virtual headphones that claim to do that sort of thing. It's all rubbish. It's marketing gimmickry. Um, but anyway, where am I going with this? I wanted to sort of define uh, a bit more about sound. So I'm going to pull up the one note. Uh, so apologizing. Uh, nobody hardly have even three speakers. Well, exactly. I mean, I have two point one, so I have a, these two, and I have a subwoofer under the desk. They are monitors, actually. If you're interested, they are Roland DM twenty one hundreds. You can't buy them anymore, but they are uh, incredibly flat frequency response. Uh, if you're into sort of audio nerdery like that, uh, so I'm going to pull up the one note, and uh, so I want to structure things a little bit differently. Uh, so I've got a pen, and. Uh, one of the things I'm going to do differently with the Pegex for sound is I'm going to be very lazy about it. I'm actually going to open this one up for the community to sort of fill in the blanks. I, I want to sort of specify what the interface is, 
uh, and and consult with people on that, and then let's just sort of let let other people potentially, I'll be honest, potentially more interested people or uh, more people with with more free time than me sort of have a go at implementing it. I think there's a lot we can already steal from the existing sound interface, but I want it to be uh, a little bit more. Uh, flexible with how things are constructed and with what I want as a bit of an end result. So I want us to think things differently. Uh, I want to have an object that fundamentally abstracts away the hardware. So how how the sound actually gets rendered on a system, uh, that's going to be some other platform. So let's, let's just pick, uh, so we've got something uh, for Linux, now we might have something on Windows, and oh, as long as it's not my cup of tea over there, hang on. Uh, we'll definitely need to have something for uh, M script and whatever the, the sound platform happens to be. Okay, and just to keep people from not complaining, we'll also have Mac. Like for the one person out there that does anything programming on a Mac. Uh, now, what I'd like to do is to have all of that sort of hidden away from the end user. Uh, that could be built on something like uh, SDL Mixer, it could be built on, uh, as we've been doing, I've got a Wasapi implementation, and there's uh, the uh, WinMM uh, implementation, uh, Magetsu did an X-Audio implementation, uh, Linux has 300 million different implementations for sound, and they're all quite complicated, but they fundamentally all sort of do the same thing. And to sort of hide these from the user, I want to create two uh, interface objects, one called an ADC and one called DAC. ADC, as you might imagine, handles input. Input Stephanie. And DAC handles output. Now, passed around the system, uh, in the previous sound pegex, we just sort of had this sort of stream of floating point numbers uh, with no particular uh, utility to them. Uh, I, I want to sort of mix that up a little bit. So I'm going to have the idea of, make sure I don't draw it behind my face, the idea of a sample. Now a single sample uh, is going to be uh, an array of uh, potentially floats, potentially doubles, whatever it's going to be. Uh, let's say double for now. And if you've got a two point uh, a stereo system, there's two channels. So basically, the sample is always going to contain uh, the channel information. Uh, Microsoft Phone. Uh, <laughs> I want to see a good old FFT. Exactly. Uh, we'll get to that, uh, PhD Jack. Exactly. They're the sort of things that I, I want to sort of start, start including. Uh, now, to interact with these systems I want to have what's called uh, sort of a, a, an audio buffer. Now which may or may not be a circular queue uh, but it's basically an array of these samples fixed in length. Now the user I can imagine is sort of set, setting up the program like this so OLC uh, sound and they'll create a, a DAC object and that will go away and automatically initialize with these sort of backends. Uh, with obviously there has to be some sort of default setup that means it's very easy to use. So you just create your your DAC output or whatever, uh, and it goes away and, and automatically configures itself to the default device with a recommended set of, of performance settings. But these uh, these ADCs and, and let's stick with the DAC for the time being because it's sort of the more important one than the ADC. Uh, the idea is that the DAC is fed by a mixer. And the mixer has a whole host of incoming streams. So these are these are just concepts that I'm thinking about sort of how, how we go about implementing them. Uh, the mixer, as you might imagine, simply combines things uh, and delivers them to the DAC. So it's very likely that whatever this is hiding behind the scenes that this has its own sort of thread going on and that's what's decoupling it from the rest of the engine so the DAC is going to periodically request of the mixer hey I need you to give me some audio 
And the mixer is then going to go looking at all of its streams, and its streams are then going to go, well, I need to get some audio data from somewhere. And these some things somewhere are going to be processes. And what the process is, well, that's some abstracted base class, some base object, uh, which has some the only the only common functionality it has is that it has uh, an output and it can have several inputs uh, by default it will it doesn't have to have any inputs uh, if the process for example is purely generative so let's say this process generates a sine wave uh, it could have some properties but that'd be some some derivation of the process uh, to give us all the diff diff different utilities that we want. So one of the processes may play an audio clip, one of the processes may be generating sound, uh, one of the processes may be manipulating sound because you can feed a process into a process. And so I wanted to build up a slightly more modular uh, in-code framework um, of, of getting sound moved around the system. Only ever one DAC then? No, doesn't need to be, not at all. Why that restriction doesn't need to exist? Uh, by default, it's convenient, uh, and we may have to look at how that actually plays out with the hardware on your system. Um, but in principle, now you just create DAC objects. We probably have to have some safety net around that. So you know, we'll have a is is okay as a function to say, well, has it been actually allocated properly? These things need to be thought about, uh, and the. The processes as well, I want to make sure that the interface for those is, is, is accurate too. Now on top of all of this framework, that's where we start to think about um, so the, the basic utility things that we want. So I still want to have sort of a play sample function. So that makes it very easy for the user that when Mario jumps you get the boing sound uh, by simply playing sample, but that's because some very basic default system already exists in the background. So there's a process sensitive to playing particular samples and they can deliver the sounds to the mixer. Of course I should have mentioned, if you're not familiar with audio, the mixer allows you to uh, sort of attenuate all of the different channels and combines them into the, the one sample required for the deck. Well, exactly. So, yeah, uh, Dan seems right there. It's it's a bit trickier. Um, <laughs> the mixer looks like it's shrugging now. <laughs> it does, I suppose, a bit. Uh, it, we, yes, the output is 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 the it's challenging because you're sort of being funneled into. You've only really got one sound card in the system. What are its capabilities to have sort of multiple sources piped into it? And that's why I think there's there's actually a stronger interplay between the mixer and the DAC than we might initially imagine. The alternate, the other side of this, of course, is the uh, the ADC, which is microphone input, line input, that sort of thing, uh, which can then deliver uh, as input into processes, and it can close the loop, uh, so we can have sort of this this data stream moving around. Now, one of the processes may be things like get the FFT data, so that might actually be, so as well as we've got our audio buffer, we might actually have something like a frequency buffer, uh, because I think. Realistically, if we're serious about doing fun things with audio, we need to be doing FFTs of audio as well. Uh, if there's a play sample, there may need to be the concept of an effect or music object. Well, I, I guess that kind of falls into the, the idea of, of a process that's set up for doing that sort of thing. Uh, so we'll have one which just plays samples, um, but can play multiple samples. So this process may uh, in the current peg, actually, sort of register your your sample object, which exists. So I guess we don't really have that. Uh, we've got an audio buffer, but there, yes, there could be something like a. Um, we'll have to come up with a name for this. So if we have a sample, uh, I don't know what's a small sample called. What what would you normally call it? So we have samples and tracks, right? Or sample and music. I guess music is just a long sample. Uh, that does actually remind me, currently we've only got WAV support. Uh, it probably is useful to have AUG um, and I guess MP3 too, although this one may be problematic um, because all of this fundamentally has to boil down to, well, a typical single header file. So uh, we'll have to have a think about what that one can provide. So that's what I want to do with sound 
allows me then to sort of cover all the bases of being generative stuff. I want to play with input stuff coming from the microphones, um, and I want to sort of close that loop. The, the tricky part is doing this in a way that makes sense to what's actually going on with the rest of the Pixel Game Engine. So it's easy enough to have a thread running that just chews through all of this, but then synchronizing that with things that are happening uh, needs to be thought about uh, carefully, I think. Also, how do we set up things like the sample? So I, I might have a little bit of code from when I was just sketching out ideas. Uh, let's just have a quick glance in here. What do I have? Uh, do I have anything useful in here? Uh, so I was setting up... Uh, this is just me sort of thinking. This isn't uh, set up to do anything particular. Um, so I was looking at, actually, is everything kind of templated so we're not really doing searches for checks? Because that makes sense, right? Uh, you, you, I don't anticipate a situation where we're deliberately trying to mix the number of channels up in a in a, in a in an environment. These sort of things can be handled on input and output anyway. Uh, so if you had one particular sample type of two channels and one of five channels, uh, you know, do we always default that you, you, you load anything with five channels, it gets down sampled to two? I don't know. They're the sort of things we can discuss. Multiple sample rate support. Yes and no. So I was going to uh, create my sample buffer uh, in such a way that it will actually genuinely sample. So you can sample based on sample index, but you can also sample based on time, uh, which would do either um, a uh, sort of linear interpolation or, or a cleverer approach, some sort of a cubic, uh, some spline-based operation, something like that. Um, of course, these all have performance overheads in order to do, but uh, in its basic way, I quite liked the idea of having just you just throw well, what time is it at this particular uh, sample, and it goes away and works it all out. Now, that will sort of soak up some of the slack between buffer sizes and things like that. <laughs> I think a sound engine isn't complete if it can't read flack. Uh, and that's as far as I got. So I was just sort of throwing some ideas together. I was going to start experimenting with uh, whether we do everything sort of statically like this, or do we do we just suck it up and remember that actually people are going to be looking at the code and people might want to see, well, how do you implement a very basic sound system, which is what this will be? Uh, do we keep it open and simple with uh, vector types and don't use templates and or just hide all that stuff in the background? These are discussions we'll have and discussions we'll have on the Discord server. Uh, but I'm thinking that, uh, yeah, we'll sort of define the interfaces and then I'm going to let the community loose on populating the back end on this. Simply because I've already implemented two back ends for Windows. Magetsub's already implemented two, I think. Um, the uh, Slavka's implemented two for Linux. And on Mac, I think it, we've got the uh, SDL back end I think exists for that I can't remember but it needs people with sort of specialist knowledge of those sort of things but it'd be nice to have some pre-made effects as well so some of the processes might be things like echo or panning or that sort of stuff which does have an effect on your game decisions so anyway there we go yes so these are the sort of the two uh, extensions which are getting my attention at the moment uh, as well as GUI of course I know GUI is popular but there's always at the moment if you desperately need a GUI in your pixel game engine there's uh, Frost's GUI which people seem to be using and enjoying so uh, go and check that out uh, I'm hoping that the game kit thing should be released before Christmas uh, alongside pixel game engine 2.17 uh, if you do want a early release of 2.17 to play with some of the more experimental functions, uh, just hit me up on the Discord. Uh, but that's it. It's been a quite a long stream, actually, tonight. A bit longer than usual. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for those that have subscribed today. Oh, we've gone over 30,000 views. Uh, that's nice. <laughs> Another milestone. It's the 40th episode of Code Zone. And uh, Standard Int has got something promising for the compile time string hash map, so I think that's uh, something to, to actually chat about too. Yeah, so loud is is very useful. Uh, it's it's good, and maybe we we just create an interface to so loud if that's what some people want. Right. Until then, uh, thank you all for watching the fortieth episode. 
Uh, I'll be on the Discord for a little bit, but then I have to go and feed somebody special. Uh, so, uh, take care, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.